Hi, everybody. Uh, it's Mr. Robbins uh, back to begin our conversation of Unit 11. So Unit 11 gets into probably one of the best known bits of my course uh, before you guys show up. Uh, it's something that you talk about the year before in world history at some length. Uh, it's something that gets talked about in classes as far back as uh, elementary school. Uh, but in culture and society, uh, the events of World War II are still a huge thing that are still coming up um, in movies, TV shows, video games. Uh, we can go down the list of, of all the, the different ways that you may have seen content related to World War II. Um, now that we are uh, over 75 years after the end of World War II in 1945, and we're starting to see uh, that generation of Americans and uh, people around the world that were alive at that time, um, the last few of them uh, beginning to pass away, uh, it is starting to diminish to some extent uh, as part of our culture and society, and we're focusing on more recent events in our lives and our parents' lives. Uh, but... Simply put, so much of the way the world is, uh, is a response to the aftermath of World War II. Um, and so by the end of this unit, uh, we're going to see an America that is going to become a lot more recognizable to us uh, in 2020 and moving forward. Um, but before we get to all that stuff, the war itself has to happen. Now, the thing about um, this unit in U.S. history is that, um, unlike World War I, we are going to get into some more nitty-gritty about battles and fighting because uh, the United States military takes a much bigger role in the fighting of World War II in comparison to World War I. So that bit of it's going to be a little bit extended, but, much like how we talked about World War I, as far as it goes for our course and what uh, I'm expected to teach, we're not going to go into tremendous depth about the causes of World War II um, and the rising of, um, of the Axis powers in Europe. Uh, with that said, though, I do want to at least start off briefly with a little bit on that, just so we're all on the same page and we, we kind of know what it is we're talking about before we get into what America is going to do in response to the outbreak of World War II, which will be the bulk of what I talk about in this video. So let's go ahead and get to it. So, the rise of totalitarianism, okay? Now, in Europe, we'll start in Europe, after World War I, the losing powers, most notably Germany, um, feel very much aggrieved and angry about how World War I turned out, okay? Now, obviously, Germany lost. German leaders aren't going to defend or argue that point, uh, but we see that a rising uh, voice of explanation for why that happened and what should be done about it now is going to start to manifest in Germany um, in the late 1920s going into the 1930s. And the person that is the most notable voice for this is on the screen, and you know, you know who this guy is. Um, you knew who he was before you ever got into history class. Adolf Hitler. Now, Adolf Hitler was a uh, veteran of World War I. He had been injured in World War I in fighting uh, in the trenches during that conflict. Uh, but after the war, um, he, uh, and he's not the only one, uh, but he will end up connecting himself to the emerging National Socialist Party, or what we would call the Nazi Party in German. Uh, in Germany. Uh, now, this Nazi party and Hitler uh, are advocating an ideology uh, 
uh, of many different things. One that the uh, that World War One was um, a terrible tragedy, and that the Germans were unjustly punished and forced to pay these loans to Britain and France. Um, that Germany did lose in World War One, but it was not out of nowhere, and instead it was a uh, stab in the back by uh, communists within the German state and their collaborators, uh, which will get into the kind of last and most notable and piece that you guys know about Nazi ideology, uh, that those collaborators were of a inferior race, uh, primarily what Hitler would say is they were Jews, but also uh, Nazi racial ideology also saw other groups of people like the Slavs, uh, people of Russian, Poland descent, uh, we're talking about there, the Roma people who are often called gypsies, we shouldn't use that term, but the Roma people in Europe, and that all of these, these inferior racial groups um, helped to contribute to Germany's loss, and that in order to reclaim its greatness, Germany uh, will not only have to go back to war eventually with the other powers of Western Europe, but cleanse themselves of these lesser peoples, okay? But, of course, Hitler is not the only totalitarian dictator to arise to power in this time. The other, you see, is uh, right to his uh, right in this picture, Benito Mussolini, who he actually gets on the international stage before Hitler even does, uh, he's the one that coins the political philosophy that Hitler and himself share, fascism, okay, uh, this idea that um, countries ought and should be strong, they ought to have common unified purposes, uh, usually to uh, grow their empires, become stronger countries, impose their will on other weaker nations, uh, and that everything in society should be focused on these efforts, uh, from business efforts to individual efforts, all of it's together to try and increase the greatness of the country. Okay? Now, Mussolini comes to power in Italy in the 1920s, and by the time Hitler comes to power in Germany in, uh, in the 1930s, 1933, uh, these two uh, will kind of be the, the most notable members of this growing totalitarian movement in Europe. At the same time, we will see that a similar situation is occurring over in Asia with the Empire of Japan, where uh, as Japan, in the wake of World War I, is generally pretty strong in comparison to their neighbors, they decide to uh, try to make an empire of their own in Asia, uh, starting uh, in uh, northern China. Uh, during the 1930s, they invade northern China and begin a long, drawn-out war uh, with the Chinese government, which is collapsing and uh, facing internal civil war at the time. Uh, and the Japanese are trying to grow their holdings uh, across Asia, uh, using very brutal tactics to do so and to you know, impose the glory of Japan on the rest of Asia. Now, in all of this, of course, in the 30s, we were dealing with what we just talked about in Unit 10, the Great Depression. And so the American viewpoint on all of this, at least as we start, is a position that we have talked about quite a bit. Just basically trying to stay out of it, what we would call isolationism. And so with that... As things develop in the 1930s, going into the late 1930s and early 1940s, and World War II is beginning, we do need to investigate how is America going to respond to the rise of these totalitarian dictators? How is America going to respond once these, uh, these dictators in Europe and Asia start going to war with their neighbors and trying to take over more and more territory? What are we going to do about it? Anything, right? Well, of course, you know, with a bit of hindsight, yeah, we're going to get into World War II, duh, right? Didn't you say at the beginning of the video? Yeah, I did. But it was not inevitable uh, in the 1930s that we would, right? Now, in 1939, okay, well, there we go. In the 1930s, as the 
rise of totalitarianism pops up, our initial response is going to be isolationism. Kind of going back to that uh, position at, put out as far back as George Washington that America ought to, in foreign affairs, stay out of the foreign affairs of other countries, not get involved in alliances, so we don't get drawn into conflict, right? Now, of course, if you're thinking about it, did we break that when we entered in World War II, World War I? Yeah, probably. Yeah, we did. Okay? But that doesn't mean that there aren't Americans, regular Americans and American politicians that don't want, that don't look at World War I and say, that was a mistake. Right. And there are many Americans who say we shouldn't have gotten involved in that war. That wasn't our fight. And if another one comes up, we don't want to be a part of it. OK. And that's what leads Congress to pass a series of neutrality acts from 1935 to 1937. Now, we're not going to kind of break these out and say what each of these did. We'll just talk about them in general. And so generally speaking, what the neutrality acts did is they would make it illegal for the United States and United States co uh, companies to sell weapons uh, to countries who are fighting at war, okay? So we're not going to give weapon to e weapons to any side of the countries fighting at war, so we don't seem like we are partial to one side or another. And it would require trade done during wartime to be done on foreign ships. So if we were going to trade other goods other than weaponry, Foreign ships would have to come to America, pick up these goods, and take them back to their home country. Now, these two things were clearly designed to stop two things that came up um, with uh, World War I. One, that we were selling weapons to countries and we sold more weapons to the British and the French than the Germans which kind of made the Germans hate us, okay, and want to attack our ships. And then, yes, the other one, that American ships and American um, sailors and passengers on ships were killed in German submarine attacks. And so the idea behind these two provisions is that, well, if we aren't selling weapons with anybody, we're not going to be a target. And if we don't have boats doing foreign trade with other countries, then they can't sink our ships, right? These, this is basically designed to keep us out of getting into the war the same way we did with World War I, right? Now, the thing is, though, is that the president, still at the time, is FDR, okay? He is serving uh, out his second term as all this stuff is starting to go down. Um, but he kind of sees a few steps ahead of many of the other American politicians and the American people. And what he kind of sees in... in hindsight, we know he's right, is that these aggressive nations like Nazi Germany, and Italy, and Japan, they're not going to stop being aggressive just because. That, that's not going to happen, okay? And so Roosevelt tries to push the people, the American people along to kind of seeing this point. Now, he knows he can't just straight up declare war or whatever, but he does try to, in, uh, in 1937, to make this argument that we should quarantine aggressor nations, meaning that all of the countries of the world should try not to trade or do any business with countries that are invading other countries like Nazi Germany would, like Italy already had, like Japan was already doing. But... The American people at this time, they don't want to hear that because to them they hear, okay, you're just going to draw us into another war and we got our own problems over here with the Great Depression. So we do not do much at the beginning, okay, as these totalitarians rise in Europe and in Asia, okay? But that is going to change. Now, in Europe, in September of 1939, uh, the, the Nazis officially start World War II with the invasion of Poland. Now, in the uh, months and years before this, the Germans had gone on a, um, a spree of annexation and taking over lands in Central and uh, Southern uh, Europe, uh, but now they are actively invading the Polish government, uh, the, the country of Poland, who is allied with Britain and France. Now, up until this point, Britain and France had done their best to avoid war, because as much as the American people want to stay out of a war, many Europeans 
especially the winning sides in World War I, Britain and France, they don't want another big war because that first world war was so costly to them in money and in lives. So they try everything they can do to appease Hitler and his, uh, and his Nazi government by like saying, okay, yeah, you can have about half of Czechoslovakia. That's fine. Just, just take it, okay? And the Munich Agreement in 1938. But what's clear by September of 1939 is that Hitler has ambitions to grow Germany, right? And he'll do it if you, let, if you just let him take it over without a fight, he'll do it. But if you're going to make him fight, he's going to do it anyway. And so by September of 1939, both Britain and France realize this, and they realize they have to go back to war with Germany, okay? Now, where are we at with this? Well... We are not really big fans of Nazi Germany here. There are some folks in America that like the Nazis, but most Americans don't care too much or actively dislike the Nazis. And, and Roosevelt, our president, is far closer to the leadership in Britain and France than to the Nazi Germans, okay? But at the same time, we are also kind of still desiring this isolationism, okay? We still want to stay pretty neutral. So... The Congress and F President uh, FDR find kind of a middle ground here with the cash and carry provision, which would amend the neutrality acts that said, okay, yes, now we can sell weapons to the Allies, okay? So in this, we are kind of taking a side here, but also we're trying to stay out of direct involvement by making it where these Allied nations, if they were going to buy weapons from us. They had to pay for them in cash. They could not take out loans and pay them someday down the road. They had to give us hard money now, and then they could have their weaponry. And they still had to transport those supplies on their own ships. So American ships would not be taking these overseas and potentially get sunk by German U-boats. Okay? Now, at this point, you know, of course, we're not quite neutral anymore, but we're or, and I, not quite isolationist anymore, but we're not fully engaged in the war yet. But that's going to pretty rapidly change, okay? Now, this, though, these two cartoons show us a little bit about where the American people's heads are at at this moment, okay? Many Americans are saying, keep the U.S. out of war, be neutral, stay neutral in this. You know, invoking the memory of, of George Washington and saying we need to stay out of these foreign affairs, and this cartoon here really should be surprising, okay? Based on what you probably know about World War II, you'll know that it is talked about a lot as a way or a re America fighting to protect democracy. But look at this cartoonist and see how they think America is going to protect democracy as World War II is beginning. So you have Uncle Sam here, okay, standing by the Capitol, looking over at war mad Europe, which is in flames and on fire, right? And democracy has just swum across the Atlantic Ocean. She's wet and she's kneeling and, and just begging Uncle Sam to stay out. Stay out for my sake as well as your own. And at the bottom you see America, the last refuge of democracy. So many Americans are arguing that the only way we can save democracy is by not getting involved in this war. Um, and that democracy will at least be safe in the United States. Very interesting, very, very interesting take on it that you guys probably don't know or haven't been exposed to because, as you guys know, we joined World War II, right? Now, again, FDR, though, realizes that this is something that it's not going to just stop. And if folks really want to think we're not going to get drawn into this fire over in Europe, they're lying to themselves, okay? And so while Congress complains about it, FDR is begging, like, let's, let's amend the Neutrality Acts. Let's do something. Let's help out the Allies more, okay? Now, let's move forward into 1940. Now, in the summer of, of 1940, things changed pretty dramatically. Now, after the invasion of Poland, really within two weeks... Uh, the Nazis had taken control of Poland, and they actually took it, and they split it in half and gave the Soviets uh, of, the, of the USSR part of it, and the Nazis took another part of it. Uh, but then that part of the fighting essentially stopped, okay? But 
the Germans were still at war with Britain and France. Now, nothing really happened for a few months until the summer of 1940, when all of a sudden, Nazi Germany will rapidly invade France. And in a matter of weeks, the Nazis have invaded France and have captured Paris, and the French have surrendered to the Nazis. Uh, and a large amount of France is kind of directly taken over by Nazi control, and then a smaller part, Vichy France, is set up as a, as a puppet government of the Nazis that will basically do whatever the, the Nazis and Hitler tells them to do. And so at this point, by mid-1940, it's a war mostly between Germany and Britain. And Britain is basically standing alone against the expansion of Nazi Germany. And what happens is that at this point, the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill comes to, um, to FDR and says, listen, um, if we don't get some help from you guys, like, we're going to have to surrender. Like, we can't fight this war, right? Uh, one thing that was happening with the British is that they were running out of money, okay? So they wanted to buy weapons from us, but they didn't have a lot of money left to spend, okay? Um, and if they didn't have those weapons, they probably could not put up an effective defense against the Nazis. So FDR pushes foreign Congress, and receives the passage of the Lend-Lease Act, okay? Now, this Lend-Lease Act would toss out most of the neutrality acts, and it would say, okay, now uh, the U.S. can send war supplies to allied nations like Britain. We can lend them to them, so no longer do they, we force them to pay up front, okay? And now we are agreeing to transport these goods on American ships that will be armed, American merchant ships that are armed and prepared to fight back against a possible attack. Now, at this point, we're still not in the war, but we're even closer to being in the war than we ever had. And FDR, again, seeing maybe two steps ahead, sees that one big problem with World War I is that when we did enter, we couldn't actually fight in the war for almost a whole year because we didn't have enough soldiers and enough materials for those soldiers. So FDR takes an unprecedented action, something that had never happened before in American history. And during a time of peace, because technically we're not at war with anybody yet, and in 1940, he institutes the first ever peacetime draft. And young men from around the country are called in and obligated, forced to join the military, and they begin getting trained um, already in 1940 for the potential of a entrance into this growing conflict of the Second World War. Now, this Lend-Lease Act, which is passed in 1941, is absolutely crucial to the Allied war effort. Um, by this point, the strongest industrial power in the world was the United States of America, and it wasn't all that close. Okay, uh, We have tons and tons of factories, Tons and tons of raw materials to make guns and bullets and artillery and planes and tanks and so on, okay? And so this Lend-Lease Act starts to make it where we are going to start transporting large amounts of goods across the world. So, of course, to Britain, they're going to get the biggest benefit of this. Uh, by the end of the war, we will have lent $5 billion uh, $5.2 billion worth of guns and weaponry, uh, tanks, planes, all that stuff put together to the United Kingdom to help them win this war. Next up, we end up giving uh, $2.9 billion to the Soviet Union, the USSR, to fight this war, which, based on what you should know, comes after World War II, might be a little surprising. But, of course, during World War II, we are allied with the Soviets uh, who eventually themselves are going to get invaded by the Germans in 1941. Hence, they will need our help. Okay, uh, But other, other areas, like the British had tons of colonies in Africa, the Middle East, and the Mediterranean, so we give uh, $1.8 billion uh, to countries around there. And then in the Pacific, China, Australia, New Zealand, India, $1.3 billion worth of weaponry and so on during this Lend-Lease program. This all together is going to help get us a nickname during World War II, and this one has been one that uh, has used many times 
in the future, okay? Uh, the arsenal of democracy. So an arsenal is where you keep weapons, all right, or where weapons are made. And we are the ones making weapons for the democratic forces around the world, at least at this point led by the UK, uh, Great Britain, uh, but soon will be led directly by us. Now, the thing, though, is, is that even as this Lend-Lease Act spins up, the Axis powers are tremendously successful in Europe. And so we are getting really, really close to having an undeclared war with Germany. Um, the uh, Germans are pushing uh, by 1941 deep into the Soviet Union, very, very quickly into the Soviet Union, potentially um, taking that new ally of the British out of the war very quickly, okay? Um, and so there's pressure on FDR to step up our efforts. Um, we start to see that as we are tra transporting goods across the Atlantic, German submarines, U-boats, are starting to attack our ships. So Roosevelt will give the naval ships transporting these goods authorization to shoot back and shoot down uh, uh, Nazi U-boats if they're attacked. So that, we're not at war yet, but we're shooting at each other already, okay, in small-scale ways. But also by the summer of 1941, it's feeling more and more inevitable that America is going to join World War II, and it's a question of it, of when, not if. So FDR will, in secret, because again, the American people still in 1941 don't want to be involved in World War II and don't want to fight in the war, he in secret meets with the Prime Minister of Great Britain, Winston Churchill, and they secretly agree on a document called the Atlantic Charter that would set out a few plans. One, it set out a war strategy if the U.S. entered World War II. Essentially, their war strategy was, we have to go and defeat the Nazis first before we do anything else. And then this plan, the Atlantic Charter, also included a plan for a post-war United Nations to replace the League of Nations and hopefully be more robust and more powerful to prevent international conflicts like that were already going on, okay? Uh, but this is a pretty dire time for the uh, Allied powers, okay? Up here you see kind of what the, 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 the situation was as we moved from 1941 uh, and then later to the war, okay? Um, at their largest extent, you see that Germany and their allies in Italy control all of this here in purple, a huge chunk of Western and Eastern Europe. And they are, as we close out 1941, seemingly get, getting even stronger as every week passes on. And so that's why this meeting was so integral. Okay, You have... FDR and Churchill sitting here, okay? Now, of course, and I, I'm, I believe I mentioned this in Unit 10, uh, in almost all these pictures, you're going to see the two men seated next to each other, not standing. Uh, that was not because of anything that was wrong with Churchill, but rather what was wrong with our president, because Franklin Roosevelt had suffered a case of polio as a younger man, which made him paralyzed. He could not stand although he did use braces from time to time to stand as he gave speeches in public. In reality, he's not really able to walk, okay? Uh, so there's no surprise why you see him seated in many of these pictures we're going to see over this, the rest of this unit. Now, in this way, perhaps this cartoonist is seeing a change, okay? So you've got the Statue of Liberty here passing the torch of world liberty to... FDR and Churchill, and down here you have the kind of grasping hand coming down from below, representing the rest of Europe, and hopefully we can pass that torch of liberty and freedom to them, okay? Now, one of the biggest issues early on in the war is how do we get our stuff to Europe, okay? And this was a problem that we had faced back in World War I as well, but there are Huge numbers of German submarines patrolling throughout the North Atlantic. And in fact, you can see here, um, even on the coast of the United States, like down here by Georgia, each one of these little boats represents something like 10 Allied ships that are sunk. They're sinking ships on the coasts of the United States, all right? Is it a ton of them? No, but it's, it's definitely happening. 
And so we've got to come up with a plan to get stuff over there. And what we end up doing is very, very similar to what we would use in World War I, wherein we would use uh, the convoy system, where we would put a lot of our ships together, and allow the ships to protect each other as they move through the Atlantic. Uh, it was thought back at, at the beginning of World War I that this was a dumb plan because, well, if you put all the ships together, they'll be easier to find. But by this point in World War II, it was pretty clear if you group all the ships together, they can help defend each other, and actually it makes it where the, the submarines are far less effective at sinking American ships. Now, so far, all I've talked about is our response to what was going on in Europe. But, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, that's not the only thing that's going on. There are problems over in Asia, and the aggression there of the Empire of Japan is what is the big problem there. Now, way back in the early 30s, the Japanese had started their aggressive push, pushing into uh, China first, but they are, by the early 40s, threatening many other places in uh, Southeast Asia with their desire to make their greater East Asian crow prosperity spears, they called it, basically this huge empire that would be throughout East Asia that they could use to extract materials, minerals, oil, all these things to grow the empire of Japan. Now, we, the United States, we have interest in the uh, Pacific, most notably the Philippine Islands, which were territory of the U.S. Um, at this point in 1941. And we feel, with good reason, that these holdings may be under threat by a growing Japan. And so FDR comes out and says some pretty strong words towards Japan and their ag uh, aggressiveness as we get into 1941. Okay? Now, one thing that FDR and the U.S. government will do is they would create an embargo. Okay, an embargo is shutting down all trade. Uh, and in this case, we're shutting down the trade of iron and oil to Japan. Now, this was a pretty big deal because the United States, number one, is one of the biggest world producers of both of those resources, iron and oil. Okay, so if we say we're not going to trade with the Japanese anymore, all of a sudden they have a lot fewer people to buy iron and oil from. Okay, but also we push other countries to embargo the Japanese with the intention to try and take these resources away from them. Because the reality is, is that by 1941, these two resources are absolutely integral to a war effort. You need iron to make into steel, to make into guns, to make into tanks, to make into planes. Okay, you don't have iron, you can't make that stuff. You need oil to power the planes and the tanks and all these new things that are kind of becoming uh, major war weapons during World War II. You take away their oil, they can make all the planes they want, they can't fly the planes. They can make all the ships they want, they can't actually like use the ships because they don't have any gas, okay? Now, the Japanese saw how damaging this was to their war effort, okay? Um, but they, and the Japanese did this a lot, they kind of took two two directions on it, right? Publicly, they say they want to negotiate, okay? Uh, and the uh, Prime Minister of, of Japan, Hideki Tojo, he will send an envoy to the United States to try and negotiate a resolution to this embargo in some way. But low-key, they knew that, that really they didn't want a resolution, that they would probably not get a resolution that they liked from the United States, so, in secret, they begin a plan to attack the U.S. Uh, and perhaps knock us out of, a, of being a fighting force right away. Now, this shows us what the extent of Japanese expansion was as we get to the close of 1941. As you see here, large parts of northern China have been taken over by Japanese control. Um, we see that they had already taken over Korea. They were looking at parts down in uh, French Indochina, parts of what are today Vietnam, um, southern, southern China. Uh, lots and lots of, of attacking, lots of battles. And the, 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 the Chinese are not really able to effectively stand up to this because, well, they 
are having their own internal conflicts, okay? Uh, now, we see that some of the most atrocious things that happened during all of World War II happened in this very early stage of World War II between Japan and China. Uh, probably most notably is uh, the so-called Rape of Nanking, where the uh, Chinese city of Nanking is thoroughly destroyed. Uh, thousands and thousands of Chinese uh, soldiers, but also civilians, are killed. And as the name implies, there are also, you know, um, assaults on women, women killed, children killed, kind of very, very brutal fighting um, between the Japanese and the Chinese, uh, something that neither the Japanese or Chinese have forgotten even all the way till today in 2020. Now, of course, we're talking about the close of 1941 and not going beyond that because something happens in December of 1941 that will end our isolationism once and for all. December 7th, 1941, as President Roosevelt would put it, a day which would live in infamy. Now, in the early morning hours on the island of Hawaii, Hawaii by this point is still a territory of the United States, so it's not its own state yet, uh, but it is a massively developed island that is home to the Pacific Fleet of the United States. That's where they're headquartered out of, out of Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. Um, and so the early morning in Hawaii, which means that back on the American East Coast, it was already late in the day, um, there are reports of a potential large force approaching Pearl Harbor. Now, the military folks on the ground in Pearl Harbor get reports of this, but they don't rightly believe it. Maybe it was a mistake. It doesn't make sense. But, of course, shortly after, planes begin to fly over Pearl Harbor, start dropping bombs, start to shoot at ships, and then it becomes very clear that the Japanese have instituted a sneak attack on us at Pearl Harbor with the intention of trying to destroy the U.S. Pacific Fleet and potentially make it impossible for us to, to really stop the Japanese from doing anything they wanted in the Pacific. Now, this attack is devastating, will be the most uh, American lives lost uh, until the events of 9-11-2001, uh, uh, much closer to our own time. Um, and it very rapidly causes a change. Now, it's really not usually the case in this class where, you know, things kind of switch overnight, but this is a case where they do. Uh, a public opinion poll show us that, like, the week before Pearl Harbor, so in early December 1941, the vast majority of Americans did not want to get involved in World War II. But by December 8th, public opinion polls show us that a vast majority of Americans did want to engage in World War II. And it had everything to do with the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. The day after Pearl Harbor, Congress will declare war on Japan. And now we're in direct war with Japan. And then the Japanese, who had signed a treaty with both the Germans and the Italians to mutually protect themselves... Um, would then also be joined in, uh, a few days later by Germany and Italy declaring war on us. And now World War II um, looks like we think it does with the Americans finally involved in this earth-shaking conflict. Now, as this war begins, though, the U.S. has a challenge that most of the other nations don't have. The, the Germans have this perhaps to some extent, but not even the way that we do. Because the United States virtually is going to end up fighting, we call it here, a two-front war. It's two different wars. We're fighting a war in Europe, in what we would call the European theater, against the Nazis of Germany and the Italians. And then we're fighting another war in Asia against the Japanese. And in any other time period, like that would be a big enough war, just one of those areas at once. But we don't get the opportunity to just fight in one area and then another area. No, we got to start fighting all at once against both uh, the European uh, Axis powers of Germany and Italy and the Asian Axis power of Japan all at once. 
With that said, though, even though Japan was the one that actually attacked us and actually just drawn us into this war, the more immediate threat, as was seen by FDR, was Germany. Why? Well, because the Germans, as 1941 ends, are really on the brink of knocking the Soviet Union out of the war, and they might be able to defeat Britain and knock Britain out of the war. So we know we need to go try and help our allies and keep them in the fight and not lose them. But that's going to be easier said than done. So next time we will get back into talking about the war um, and what its impacts were, especially here on the American home front. Uh, but I did want to just show you at least a few of these images. So, of course, by the time we get to Pearl Harbor, you know, photography is quite common. Um, and so we have lots and lots of different footage, video footage, some in color of the Pearl Harbor attack. Uh, really, really tragic events of that day. Uh, again, uh, over 2,000 American sailors and civilians will be killed. Um, still today, there are sunken boats in Pearl Harbor. The USS Arizona is now essentially like a memorial site uh, for the Pearl Harbor attack as it sits in Pearl Harbor. Um, they can't move it for a couple of reasons. One, if they move the boat, uh, it would probably leak tons of oil and kill the ecosystem. But the second reason is that that's a final resting place for uh, a, a, a few hundred American sailors in that ship, okay? Um, with these images, you probably can see why so quickly Americans come along to this idea of avenging Pearl Harbor. Our bullets will do it. We highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain from the Gettysburg Address being used in this issue, remember December 7th, and we will remember. And so next time, we'll get into us preparing to fight in the war here on the home front. We'll see you then. Bye.